What does hyperlocalization mean? Coming up. Hello and welcome back to The Freelancers. A few weeks ago, I was kindly invited by the University Napoli Orientale to be part of their island series on uh, translation. The university holds this series of seminars uh, weekly and invites people from the industry, from policy, from academia to talk about different topics of translation. So I was very excited and honored when uh, Francesco reached out to me. The overall topics of that week was othering in translation, translation of the other. Uh, that is kind of a philosophical topic, but I, want, I was there, invited there to represent the practical side. So I really wanted to come up with a practical uh, example. So I went for a hyperlocalization study on translating for Switzerland and for Germany. And of course, whenever I give a talk, I want to use the footage to show you guys as well. I don't want to waste that type of content. So I cut together this video with my talk. I hope you enjoy it. Adrian uh, Popst. Um... He is a Swiss native German language specialist, currently living in Brussels, Belgium. He has provided um, freelance language and consulting services. He has working languages for translation of English and French into German for Germany and Switzerland. Additionally, he is a content creator and hosts the YouTube channel Freelance Verse. Uh, where he publishes a video every Monday about various topics surrounding freelancing, uh, translation and languages. He holds a, a Bachelor of Arts in Translation Studies, as well as a Master um, of Science in Information and Communication Sciences. Adrian Prop's talk will be about uh, hyperlocalization in the context of othering, an example based on German for Germany versus German for Switzerland. Please, Adrian, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria. And thank you, Francesco, also for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. It's the first time I'm talking to like university students and uh, very excited. I already told uh, Francesco that I'm not a researcher, not a professor, if he still wants to invite me, but he said, yeah. So I'm here to, pra to represent the practical side and uh, the freelancer side. Um, yeah, as Maria said, I'm a German translator and content creator. I, I make videos about translating. So literally all my professional work has to do with translation, everything I do all day. Uh, so I was thinking how I can link, you know, this topic of othering with a practical real life example of what I'm actually doing. And I think the thing I come across daily and this it has the most importance in this context for me is really specific target on audiences in highly specific target markets. Uh, especially in marketing translation, I feel like when you're trying to sell something with your text, uh, localization has to be number one priority in the translation process, right? In order to properly target your global marketing campaign, let's say, you need far more than just translating. You need to understand variations from one market to another, for example, in terms of, you know, their social values, economy, politics, uh, technology, culture, etc. So in other words, you need localization. It is basically the process of adapting your text to your target markets and audiences. So it reflects the, the needs of the, of the customers you're trying to reach. Now, there are a couple of factors that can come into play when looking at localization. For example, age, gender, uh, politics, I mentioned before, hobbies. Um, but just the key thing that where it links to the concept, context of othering is that you avoid discrimination when you're writing for a certain audience, right? An example, for I talked to someone recently that said uh, he was asked to write for a right-wing newspaper. And uh, there is a whole, you know, a whole ethical question in there if you want to do that or not. But of course, once you commit to it, it's very important that you uh, avoid left wing ideologies in your in your writing, right? Or also vice versa. So really have to think of uh, the target audience you're writing for, because it's very hard to. Uh, yeah, I mean, the ethics aside, it's very hard to accurately and topically translate something you you completely disagree with. So definitely make sure to only accept chops you can identify with. So how can you actually train this? How can you serve all these uh, different audiences with the right register, right? Right tone, vocabulary, uh, definitely practice and lifelong learning, right? As a translator, it comes in very handy if you like reading. 
uh, not only professionally but also personally uh, for me especially that that helps the most reading different registers reading different genres sometimes even from children books to to philosophy you know if you can cover everything you know how how readers perceive things and um, that definitely helps so if you can find some interest in different uh, types of books definitely do that uh, there have been countless times when I found something in a book that I can then later use in a project of mine. Um, so yes, definitely also read in your different working languages, that's clear. Uh, speaking of these languages, what I really want to focus on today is, so I mentioned before that age, gender, politics and all these things can be important. But for us translators, there is really one thing we can set ourselves apart, and that is uh, localizing for specific countries. So me, I'm originally from Switzerland, from the German speaking part, and I work a lot for Swiss companies and end clients. And uh, even though I'm technically then a German translator, right, but my choice of words and my choice of register can be vastly different when I'm writing for Germany or for Switzerland. And brands and companies are often not aware of this, and I, I need to educate my clients often about that. And that's also something you should remember if you are a student now for the future, that you are the experts, right? So you need to also tell your clients what they what they really need, because a lot of them don't know it. And if you detect a flaw in their workflow, it's your job to, to give them that last step, you know, to, to make the conversion happen. It happened multiple times for me that I told my clients that that wanted something hyper-localized for Austria, for example, or the north of Germany. I told them, look, I, I could do it, but it's better if you hire a local translator who understands the customs and the culture better than me. That might seem a bit strange to them in the beginning because you are technically like uh, turning down work, right? But it can also build a lot of trust if you are transparent with your clients and uh, about your abilities. So why is it so important? Every continent, every country, and even every region within a country has slightly different purchasing behaviors, right? For some locals, this can be even considerably different because of the distance between them. So if you're thinking uh, Spain versus Argentina, for example, or France, Senegal, same language technically, but completely different cultures, people, uh, whole wealth structure, buying behavior. Uh, now, Switzerland and Germany are neighbors, so uh, there is a lot of overlap, especially Swiss people watch a lot of German TV, for example, at home. So because there aren't that many Swiss TVs apart from the national ones. So we are quite in tune with what's happening in Germany. Not the other way around, by the way, Germans don't really know what's happening in Switzerland. And that's also already something to keep in mind when you're translating for these two locales. Uh, and considering the different wealth structures there are between Switzerland and Germany, the whole approach to money is very different there. And that's so important in marketing translation, right? Uh, that has to be taken into account any any time. Uh, Swiss audiences put a lot of value on high quality, rather over quantity, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's a bit more expensive in that regard, uh, where German people, for example, are very direct especially the further north you go, I would say. Uh, Swiss people are not direct at all. Uh, we prefer to beat around the bush and, you know, <laughs> uh, sw sweep things under the rug. And that's once again something you have to think about. So suddenly when you combine these two examples, a brand is faced with, let's say, um, uh, when they have to localize a headline, for example, into German. I have an example here that I recently had to do, actually. Uh, that said, get the cheapest smartwatch in the game right now, right? And when you have to translate this, you are kind of facing a dilemma based on where, where it will be published, because you might want to translate it quite literally for it, for Germany. And then you would have something like Hodiet, the günstigste smartwatch of the mark. That, that's quite literally what it says in English. But then for a Swiss audience, that might sound a bit strange, because first of all, you are addressing the buyer informally, that can be okay, depending on your register, right? If you want to sell to 50 plus though, it would I would not do that, for example. Uh, then uh, you are being very direct with the uh, whole idiots. That means basically get it now. And your focus is on the, the günstigste, the cheapest. So suddenly you have a call to action that might not get you the desired conversions in Switzerland. And of course, these are all 
hypothetical scenarios based on my experience, but I do talk to my clients a lot about these things and uh, there seems to be definitely results on that. Uh, my last point, localization can, can go even further, right? It doesn't stop at country borders. Uh, Switzerland is very small, but very unique in terms of languages. So we have four national languages. And of course, for all the different languages, you need different translators. That's That goes without saying. But even within the German regions, the language develops so quickly for such a small area that there is even a need now for hyper localization within the German the Swiss German market, right? Uh, nationwide supermarkets, for example, they are launching a lot of local campaigns and there they have to be careful because you don't want to promote uh, something with a, a phrase from Zurich, for example, in a supermarket in Bern. That would not come across well because there are some rivalries between the cities. And uh, an example that's happening right now with the Christmas season coming up, uh, is Christmas cookies. Uh, Christmas cookies is a word that is basically set a bit different by everyone in Switzerland. I don't know why, I don't know where it comes from. Uh, the only thing that it's clear is that it can't be the German translation for Germany, which would, which would be Kekse, but no one says that in Switzerland. It sounds a bit odd for us. It doesn't sound festive, so no one would buy that. Uh, the most commonly used in Switzerland would be Gutsli. But even when I read that, I know immediately that someone from the east of the country wrote that, right? So even with such a, a, a small word like Christmas cookies, uh, localization comes into place and can really mess up your marketing campaigns. Uh, to sum up, it's uh, definitely number one tool we have to avoid othering in this context. Uh, we can avoid making people feel left out by speaking their own language. Even though globalization brought us closer together as a whole, consumers will always still be much more likely to buy something when you write in their own words. So always try to put yourself in the shoes of the audience you're writing to, writing for. Uh, I know that sounds obvious, but I still see too many translators not doing that because I do a lot of revision work for Switzerland and it's oftentimes written for Germany and I have to change a lot and then like justify my changes. Uh, just think of that and sometimes the ideal solution is not the one in your head, but it's the one in your audience's head and you need to try to get in there somehow. Thank you very much for listening.